Hello everyone, academic here, doing GCSE, medicine through time, history of medicine, content a lot of it used for AQA, however applicable to all courses, let's get in here. Hippocrates, first guy in our course, this course, uh, circa 1000 to circa 1500. So he's the first guy, he's the theory of the four humours, so there's four humours that make up your body, it's phlegm, yellow bile, blood and black bile and basically you get ill if there's like a lack of balance um, and you resolve that through purging for example bloodletting so you go you know sort of poke a hole in your body and the blood comes out and sort of balances it out obviously we're starting off with this part one ancient medicine and medieval medicine it can be all very vile uh, and i basically advocated for uh, um, going through medicine and looking at things through rational means and careful observation that was just like main gist fact, Hippocratic Oath, still used by doctors today, all um, doctors have to swear it. Um, and the Hippocratic Collection, which he made up, was made of detailed lists of symptoms and treatments that you can also use to train doctors. In fact, we used for centuries to come. Now we move on to someone a bit more mid. This is basically what I like to call the mid Hippocrates. Basically, Galen, he's going to keep coming up in the course. Very good to know in your exam. Now he's basically Hippocrates repackaged, pretty much Hippocrates from Wish. Okay, it's a bit mean, but for this course you can think of it like that. He developed rather than theory of all humours, he created the theory of opposites, which is basically humours, but also using the seasons and the weather. So combining it all to one single theory. So for example, if you've got phlegm, it's something cold, you've got to treat it, so it's kind of wintry, and you've got to treat it with something hot. So you're going to have some hot pepper, for example. Now, he had dissections, but they were for animals, and this is the crucial thing. So although, you know, on the one hand, yeah, he did do some good stuff. He um, discovered that the brain and not the heart controlled speech, and the arteries carry blood, and he did that thanks to the, um, the pig experiment. But the problem with Galen is that his ideas were strictly defended by the Catholic Church, and that means they lasted for a thousand years and were taught for a thousand years. And the problem with ideas that are taught for a thousand years is that they don't evolve and they're protected and it prevents future progress. But there are also some good non-Western people in the history of medicine. For example, Avicenna is the very key one. Now, he kept ideas of Hippocrates and gained a liar after the fall of the Roman Empire. Sort of everything kind of went to... Uh, went to bits in Europe after that happened. And he combined his ideas as a big one, 1025 canon of medicine, where he described 760 drugs, obesity, anorexia, you name it. He did a bunch of stuff there. And the canon of medicine was the standard medical text used to teach Western doctors until the 17th century from then on. Now, he was actually kind of encouraged by Islam because... It promoted dissections and said that for every disease, Allah has given a cure. So in contrast, kind of with the church thing, where the church, as we'll see, used it to suppress, Galen to suppress progress, this actually kind of contributed to it. Anyways, now there are also other Muslims, as when we'll discover why we're talking about this specific civilization right now, but Razis had 150 books published, you know, lots of spare time, lots of yapping, clearly, but... He did some good stuff. He criticized the theory of opposites in writings such as Doubts About Game. This is the first, first sequence in mid Galen series in this ancient, ancient history of medicine part one series. Um, and he promoted ethical medicine. So the doctors aim to do good, even to our enemies. So this is sort of a kind of a similar thing with Hippocrates. You know, you've got to do what's good for your patients. Ibn al Nafis, also not bad. Again, disproved Galen's theory of heart. Get the hell out of here, Galen. Investigated pulmonary and coronary circulation. This is really what he's really famous for. Um, differentiated kidney and bladder stones in Al Mujus, his famous book. But he could not his spread ideas uh, well because he was too far ahead of time. You know, womp womp, what can I say? And you can't have everything good. Now, this is why you have to uh, subscribe and hit the like button and help me get monetized because I'm right now I'm using a mouse to click through these slides, being kept in a shed, doing all these videos. Please help me afford £3.40 Tesco meal deal to eat because, uh, yeah, doing being in the London Uni, this is what I have to do to keep myself alive. Please, please GCSE people, please for the love of God. Mondino Deluzzi, surgeon number one, 
from Italy that we're going to go through. Uh, now, Mondino did public dissections, researched anatomy, published Anatomia, 1316. He was a Galen follower, yeah, but he also thought the anatomy of animals and humans differed. So that was his big sort of um, dimension where he disagreed. He did uh, detailed descriptions of brain, detailed descriptions of pancreas, and he was taught in university for 250 years, even influenced Da Vinci. So, pretty great guy. Now, Frugardi, Italian surgeon number two, published The Influential Practice of Surgery 1180, systematic but specific approach towards cures is what he promoted, and he was anti-trepanning, sort of another kind of three of the humors sort of idea. You basically drill a hole in your skull, and oh, the evil spirits are supposed to come out. And he said, ah, oh, that's a bit daft, guys. Nerves could actually be damaged permanently. That's what Frugardi said. Well, it's a pretty smart thing to say. Well, John of Ardern, now. This is a big moment because it's the first British guy in our course. We're in a British education system. Come on, we've got to have someone British on the course. The number one thing about him, as I said, he is British. Not that I have anything against doctors of other things, but you know, it's, it's, good, it's good to be a bit patriotic, you know. He had a 50% survival rate for his surgeries. Nowadays, it'd be pretty dismal. But back then, this was actually a pretty good result. He treated anal abscesses. So this is when soldiers on horseback, they're on the bums a long time. And basically, while riding on horseback, they got this sort of symptoms and abscesses that have to be treated, that have to be popped. Not really great, but you know, the GCSE people put this in the course because it's hilarious, haha, -ha, you know, 14 year olds, they love joking about rear parts, haha, -ha, you know, this is hilarious. But used opium and henbane to dull pain, published Practicus 1376, illustrations of it, instruments and operations were there, pretty solid stuff. Now, what have we got next? I even forgot, who knows? Medieval treatment of the sick, aha. Uh -huh. Medieal treatment of the sick, I actually should work out where to put this thing. Poor and ineffective in the Middle Ages, obviously. That's why we use medieval as like a sort of a slur nowadays. Now, rich people went to physicians. They're doctors with seven years of medical training, but that wasn't really good either. Um, I just realized how fast I'm talking. I really am. I'm, it's a yap fest for you guys, but write it down. Actually, here you go. Here's this. Listen to this. Do keep the attention. Keep the attention. Don't, don't click away. Don't watch XQC or something like that. Keep watching this wonderful GC history of medicine. Favorite course of history, of course, I'm sure. And everyone loves it. Now, the, the physicians, they use urine charts, bloodletting, natural remedies, and questionable cures. For example, you had asthma? Well, swallow a young frog and get better. You know, that sort of thing. So even the rich people, they probably weren't cued very much from these things. A barber surgeon, more widely used. Why is that? because they're cheaper and they did minor operations such as removing teeth and actually they got significant experience as patients came back from war and they developed sort of specialized tools for example the fleen and other sort of things but at the same time they used the kind of old methods still the old barbaric methods such as trep handing which is what we said so still not very good and people also went to apothecaries they're the, med they're the medicines that physicians prescribed were actually given out. And family and church did offer some support. Now, as a sort of last resort, you had wise women. And wise women used natural herbal remedies and supernatural cures, knowledge passed down through generations, that sort of thing. So it's kind of a bit dodgy, but what isn't in the Middle Ages? And pretty much what you had is diagnosed and prescribed based on the seasons and stuff like the doctrine of signatures so basically the idea that a natural object that looks like the body part actually cures it so you know stuff that you probably something that you'd find on five minute crafts perhaps it's the medieval version of five minutes crafts now we sort of why are we contrasting christianity with islam here you might say well this is where we explain it what was the effect of christianity on medicine you know religion was very important for medieval people but that's why they built so many you know churches and cathedral and they had a mixed effect on medicine so yes training of doctors did begin in 1200 in europe but medicine was taught as the second subject the church built 700 hospitals from 1000 to 1500 a.d obviously we're talking about but they also put ideas forward like fatalism which is the idea that death is god's punishment and we should just accept it that doctors are actually not healers but just people who diagnose disease that's not very progressive that's not going to put medicine forward 
And even people like, you know, scientist Roger Bacon, you know, bye bye, that's, uh, that's it. You know, he said doctors should come up with our new ideas. You know, he was arrested for that. And in general, there was a promotion of old ideas rather than actually trying to find something that's new. Now monasteries had systems of pipes that delivered water to wash basins and baths. And beggar Benedictine monks regularly wash clothes. Now to be fair, they're usually up, uphill, you know, on a mountain, so the water would have been cleaner there anyway. But regardless, you know, all these monks, they're washing themselves, all the nuns washing themselves, they can be pretty clean. And when diseases came around, you know, they used to actually survive quite a lot of it. Now, churches were quite unclean, so sort of you'd think it'd be a nice place to be when you're, you know, kind of like a hospital when you're ill. But the thing is, they focused on care and not cure. That was the problem. Now, they did encourage the Crusades, and I suppose the Crusades are, in a way, kind of improved medicine, because you had all these people coming back from war, and they had all these awful things that have happened to them, and that kind of promoted medicine. But at the same time, of course, the church encouraged miraculous healing, going to relics, going to pilgrimages, going to shrines, prayer. That doesn't directly help with, you know, the Black Death, for example. You know, spoiler alert for later on in this video. If you're still watching, well, most of you won't be anyway, because you guys have no attention spans. That's okay, though. For example, if you have skin problems, you can pray to St. Anthony. Now, contrast this with Islam, which arguably, you know, Middle East right now gets a lot of slander. It's a bit of an unstable region. You know, you've got like Gaza, Iran, da-da-da. Actually, you know what? You know, let's not slander it too much, because it has a history of doing a lot of progressive stuff. And this is kind of the part, you know, in medieval times, Europe would have been carnaging each other, you know, chopping off each other's heads and whatever. Islam is actually getting on with it, getting science done, getting math done, getting medicine done. And you'll see, it was actually kind of, Islam was kind of less obstructive to human progress. Why is that? Well, they had first hospitals for the mentally ill. They had universal healthcare style by Maristans. Baghdad was a center for Greek to Arabic translation. So, you know, you want to translate something from a, a, a Hippocrates' text or maybe from Galen's? Oh, you can translate it at this center. That's quite good. Islamic doctors were permanently stationed at hospitals and medical students trained alongside them. Oh, that's pretty useful. Not just training based on like centuries old books, actually getting stuff done. That's not bad. Khalif al-Rashid created a house of wisdom. The merchant Constantine the African spread Latin, uh, Latin translations of medical books and actually spread them between Europe and the Middle East. That's pretty great, but it's not all great. You know how it is, especially medieval medicine, you can never have something truly good. Or really in life, actually. Perhaps that's a lesson to learn. They did not allow human dissections and Arabic doctors still had a lot of them which preferred theoretical to practical learning. So. It's not all, you know, uh, sunshine and rainbows, so to speak. Now, here we come. So we already name dropped it. What's happening with the Black Death? Black Death, massive, massive pandemic, 1348. Now, basically killed 1.5 million Europeans, 20% of Europe's population, you know, infected fleas spread it. You know, it was a pretty, pretty awful stuff happened. But what did people think it was spread by? Well, you know, if you couldn't tell by my description of what happened through medicine so far. Well, they didn't have a blimming clue. They thought it was miasma, you know, poisonous air. They thought it was punishment from God. And they thought it was Jews poisoning the water supply. Now, what cures did they devise? The cures were as wacky and dead as the, uh, oh, pun intended, as dead as the uh, uh, thoughts about what caused it. They thought eating cooked onions, seating it, sitting in a sewer, praying to God, and quarantining via walling would stop it. And of course, for most of the time it didn't. The government kind of tried to intervene and tried to pass like 1388 legislation forbidding people from throwing animal or human waste into waterways. But basically it did, couldn't really do much because it didn't really know what was going on either. Now what happened as a result? Towns and villages deserted en masse in Europe. Now there was desperation which led to a surge in church attendance and in Britain, it even contributed to the Peasants' Revolt in 1381. Now, are you still there? Hopefully you are. If you're still there, comment the person 
out of this history of medicine called you find the fittest, male or female, or in between, we don't discriminate, which medic do you think is? And so we get on the final one, guys, you made it. You made it to the end of the first quarter because there'll be four, four videos. And if you want something else, you know, uh, put, it, put it in the comments as well. You what did the government attempt to do to improve public health? Well, so basically public health, as you can imagine, medieval times was pretty dismal. It was limited without, in terms of planning, without a sewage system, no planning regulations, rapid city growth. That's sort of what happened. What did the government then try to do to circumvent that? 1371, the London mayor prohibited the killing of large animals within the city walls. 1298, the York City Council built public latrines because the lack of hygiene was a danger to soldiers. And the mayor of Coventry issued a 1421 proclamation ordering every man to clean the streets in front of their homes or pay a fine of 12p. Now guys, you know, inflation back then, 12p used to be, you know, used to be something. I don't know what the current equivalent would be, but just, it's enough. Just put in an exam, exam all of it. They'll think you're a smart guy. Or woman, we don't discriminate. 1374, London's like, council paid people to clean the Walbrook stream and actually this hiring street cleaners sort of became a thing. They're known as going, for, ugh, going, going farmers? How the hell do you pronounce that? Anyways, going farmers. And they're actually pretty well paid. Now, you made it this far. Well, put this on while you go to bed at night. You know, give me, give me some extra watch time, help me get monetized so I can move out this shed. This is the best London real estate you're gonna get, guys, honestly. Good job for making it, and let's move on to